What research? Have you researched that the birth of Christ was changed just to make it coincide with the date the 25th of December? Christians were used to get hanged for their religion but then suddenly they were accepted by the king. How? Well, they mixed pagan religion with Christianity to make it more acceptable. New research have shown that the Christ was born on 22nd September and not on 25th December. Jesus did not have long hair like a girl. People should have chips implanted in their skulls that explode when they say something stupid. <laughs> Have you researched that the birth of Christ was changed just to make it coincide with the date the 25th of December? <laughs> what was it before it was changed? When was it changed? Who changed it? From what texts are you drawing this conclusion? Fact is, it was never changed. December 25th is a calculation given to us by Dionysius Exigus in the 6th century AD, some 600 years after the supposed death of Christ. Within that 600 year span no other dates are given for the assumed birth date of Jesus Christ. I wonder why? Many ancient sun gods carry December 25th as a day of being born, although in the case of Jesus, December 25th clearly relates to the sun dying at the winter solstice or equinoctial crossing, or in the constellation of the Southern Crux, that is a cross, it positively relates to the crucifixion of Jesus the sun. Jesus being dead for three days is evidenced by the sun hovering at a point on the horizon for three days, and then the sun moving, one degree north on the third day. Thus, Jesus the sun being born again or resurrecting after the third day, the parallels between the astrological alignments of the sun at the winter solstice and the gospel myths of the crucifixion are undeniable. So, yes. Mythologically speaking, Jesus the sun dies and is reborn or born again on December 25th. The discrepancies in Jesus' birthday, indicate his non-historical nature. The idea that the followers of a historical Jesus would have no clue as to when he was born is ridiculous, particularly in consideration of how significant birthdays were to Jewish mothers. The birth dates of the most famous godmen are thus not historical and concretized but, have varied, based on astronomical observations. This situation exists of course, because these gods are not, real people, but astrotheological motifs. Christians were used to get hanged for their religion but then suddenly they were accepted by the king. <coughs> Who hung them? What king? The myth of massive martyrdom and Christian persecution. Along with the tale that Christianity began with the Prince of Peace comes the myth that the early Christians were gentle lambs served up in large numbers as martyrs for the faith by the diabolical Romans. The myth of martyrdom starts with the purported passage of the Roman historian Tacitus in which he excoriated Nero for killing a great multitude of Christians at Rome in 64 CE. However, this passage is a forgery, one of many made by the conspirators in the works of ancient authors, and there is little other evidence of such a persecution under either Nero or Domitian, the alleged notorious persecutor of Christians. As G.A. Wells says in, Did Jesus Exist? The earliest unambiguous Christian reference to persecution under Nero is a statement made by Melito, Bishop of Sardis, about AD 170. It would be surprising if a great multitude of Christians lived at Rome as early as AD 64. The evidence for persecution under Domitian is, also, admitted to be very slight indeed. And, as the editor of Eusebius' The History of the Church states, in fact, up to the persecution under the Emperor Decius, 25051, there had been no persecution of Christians ordered by the Emperor on an imperial scale. To bolster their claims of massive martyrdom, pious Christians began around the 9th century to forge the martyrdom traditions. As Walker relates, the martyrs of the famous Roman persecutions under such emperors as Nero and Diocletian, seven centuries earlier, were largely invented at this time, since there were no records of any such specific martyrdoms. Names were picked at random from ancient tombstones, and the martyr tales were written to order. 
In reality, it was the Christian church that did much more persecuting and made many more martyrs than Rome had ever done, because religious tolerance was the usual Roman policy. The melodramatic portrayal of the early Christian movement as consisting of righteous mom and pop Christians being driven underground and ruthlessly persecuted is not reality, nor are the stories of massive martyrdom. What is reality, is that from the 4th century onward, it was the Christians who were doing the persecution. As the author of The Other Jesus says, much is made of the fact that Christians were supposed to have been severely persecuted just for worshipping Jesus, and for no other reason, by the Romans during the 1st centuries AD. Although the degree to which Christians were actually persecuted by pagans has been wildly exaggerated, the truth is, early Christians did indeed seem to have evoked considerably more than their share of scorn and antagonism from pagan authorities. This is somewhat baffling because, as has often been pointed out, the official policy of the Roman Empire, both in principle and in practice, was one of permitting near total religious freedom. This extended even to the point of allowing many practices that even modern Western nations would never permit in the name of religious freedom. But once you recognize that claiming you were about to reveal the secrets of the Son of God Jesus to the uninitiated public was a death penalty offense forbidden under the laws prohibiting people from profaning or betraying the mysteries, you begin to at least partially understand why the pagan legal officials might have tended to take for granted that it was their duty to suppress Christian preachers. To them, certain aspects of Christian preaching represented blatant criminal activities. In the mind of the pagans, such sanctions against Christians were reasonable punishments for very definite, obvious and specific violations of the law, not unwarranted persecutions of people who were innocently worshipping God in their own way. They mixed pagan religion with Christianity to make it more acceptable. <laughs> Pokem, Christianity plagiarized all the pagan ideologies from India to Egypt, to everything in between. When Christianity began to spread and conquer, they demonized the conflicting gods of the other cultures, they built their churches right over ancient pagan worship sites. Don't give us that crap, they mixed it with paganism so people would accept it. Christianity was a war engine, and it was forced down the throats of all pagans. Christianity at its roots is little but pagan astrotheology repackaged. It was not mixed, it was stolen and plagiarized backed up by the fact that, the Christian assault on astrology was furious and motivated by a desire for dominance and the replacement of the pagan astro-theology with that of Christianity, with an eye to covering up the latter's own astro-theological roots. The Christian fathers eventually were responsible for vicious persecution of, astrologers, that is those Chaldeans and others who were priests of pagan faiths. Arabic and Jewish universities and scholars kept astrology alive throughout the Middle Ages, despite continued persecution by Christians. Thus, the Christian religion and founder were based on the ubiquitous mythos and ritual that served as the mysteries, which were eventually compiled and written down. These astro-theological mysteries, however, were later carnalized and historicized to hide them once again in the Gospel tale. New research have shown that the Christ was born on 22nd September and not on 25th December. <laughs> this is hardly new research. This information was presented by Reverend G. Bishop in 1882. He states, If John was born June 24th then the birth of Jesus is correctly reckoned on December 25th, for we learn from St. Luke 1.36 that the conception of John was six months before the conception of Jesus, so that the birth of John must be six months before the birth of Jesus. But if the above contention be true, as I most assuredly believe, then the birth of John must be in March, nine months from June, and the birth of Jesus in September, six months after John's birth, and this agrees with the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, the type of our Lord tabernacling among us. On biblical grounds the birthday of Jesus is seen to have been mistimed and all comparisons with the he then fables of the sun having passed the winter solstice and once more rising higher in the sky as the days pass by, are out of court. Reverend G. Bishop says, out of court, 
they are most certainly not out of court as Nablia gives the specific date of Jesus' birth on September 22nd. September 22nd is the autumn equinox. In the northern hemisphere, the sun is rising later now, and nightfall comes sooner. This is our autumn equinox, when the days are getting shorter in the northern hemisphere. At this equinox, day and night are approximately equal in length. This is still a direct connection of Jesus being a solar deity. Strangely enough, the seed of Jesus, that is Abraham, his birthday also falls on the autumn equinox. As was Saturn also revered, during this time, the god of harvest. With all three being appellations of the sun, this is not surprising. And in my opinion, this is the very reason Jesus also holds the sickle. But to revert to the real factors to Abraham, his birthday was at the fall equinox hour, 21st of September. Saturn is Seb, and I find reasons for placing him at the autumn equinox, diametrically opposite to Osiris. Jesus did not have long hair like a girl. <laughs> Everyone knows Jesus had a Jufro, white as wool, the hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, like flaming torches. His body was like beryl, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, his face like the appearance of lightning. These are descriptions of the sun and sky, 